This is a different kind of war. There are no marching armies or solemn declarations. But we must not let this mask the central fact that this is really war. It is guided by North Vietnam and it is spurred by Communist China. Its goal is to conquer the South, to defeat American power, and to extend the Asiatic dominion of communism. Ho Chi Minh is his name. Communism is his creed. And in 1954, he sits in his jungle headquarters, plotting, scheming, directing the subversion, terror, aggression that will seal the fate of the French in Indochina. Defeat, utter and complete, comes at a remote mountain outpost called Dien Bien Phu. For seven years, the French have fought against a shadowy foe that they cannot see, cannot find, cannot conquer. And now the end has come. Dien Bien Phu falls and French resistance collapses. The nation has neither the will nor the means to carry on. At Geneva, France's humiliation is complete. Indochina is lost. Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov is present, and so too is Red China's Zhou Enlai. The two communist countries, along with 13 other nations represented at Geneva, agree to recognize and respect the sovereignty of Vietnam. It is a settlement based on the good faith of its signers. The Geneva Agreement creates not one, but two Vietnams, divided by the 17th parallel. Villages in communist North Vietnam become ghost towns as more than half a million refugees flee south of the 17th parallel in the three months between the signing of the Geneva Agreement and the triumphant entry of communist troops into Hanoi. Ho Chi Minh, the jungle fox, puts on a new and friendly face. Uncle Ho's work is not finished, his job is not done. For half of Vietnam is not communist, half of Vietnam is still free. Ngo Dinh Diem, South Vietnam's first leader, is as strongly anti-communist as Ho Chi Minh is communist. The people rally behind Diem and the infant nation prospers. Heir to a civilization thousands of years old, South Vietnam is a land proud of its past, a country eager to claim its future. The old and yet new nation moves ahead, while its neighbor to the north watches enviously, covetously. And then strikes with a terror that recognizes neither age nor sex. Despite the repeated aggression, the South Vietnamese dig in and work harder. They double the nation's production of rice in seven years. Textile plants turn out all the cotton fabrics needed in South Vietnam, while North Vietnamese women must be rationed to five yards a year. The fruits of freedom are very real. And still the aggression from the North continues and an anguished land must endure a new agony. Challenged by an enemy from without, South Vietnam is also racked by a power struggle from within. Buddhists demonstrate against Premier Diem, demanding a greater voice in the government. In 1963, Diem is overthrown and killed triggering a series of military coups. General Nguyen Khan emerges eventually as the new South Vietnamese strongman, but internal unrest continues. And the terrorist activities of the communist Viet Cong guerrillas increase and spread. American military advisors take a more active part in the conflict, 
as South Vietnam fights for survival. Like all free people in all free lands, the frightened and bewildered villagers of the embattled little land are asking only the right and the opportunity to determine their own future in peace and in freedom. A State Department white paper explains their plight. The document says, South Vietnam is fighting for its life against a brutal campaign of terror and armed attack, inspired, directed, supplied, and controlled by the communist regime in Hanoi. When an armed cargo ship is sunk off the South Vietnamese coast, captured documents prove that it has come from North Vietnam. The contraband originates largely from communist China and Czechoslovakia, as well as North Vietnam. The evidence of Hanoi's aggression is conclusive. As the crisis deepens, Russia's Premier Kosykin travels to Peking to confer with Red China's Mao Zedong. Later in Hanoi, the Soviet leader pledges whatever support is necessary to crush South Vietnam. And then he seals his pledge with a bear hug. February 1965, the Viet Cong step up their terrorist attacks. Three American bases are hit. Eight United States servicemen die, mortally wounded in their sleep. 125 others are injured. As a result of the communist tactics, 1,800 dependents of American military and civilian personnel are ordered home. On the battlefront, South Vietnam and the United States agree on a joint aerial strike at North Vietnam. It is a fateful decision. Sent aloft from the carriers Ranger, Hancock and Carl C., the planes hit Dong Hoi, a chief staging area for the communist Viet Cong infiltrators. Later, Hanoi releases these films, purported to have been taken during the bombing of Dong Hoi and showing the shooting down of a U.S. plane. Other aircraft flying over Saigon signaled yet another crisis for embattled South Vietnam, a change in governments. Army and Navy units stage a bloodless coup, and General Nguyen Cao Ki assumes the shaky reins of power in Saigon. Once peaceful city is stalked by the shadow of Viet Cong terror, a terror that can strike any time, anywhere. In March 1965, a bomb explodes in front of the United States Embassy in Saigon. Two Americans and 20 South Vietnamese are killed. Scores of others are injured. This is the face of Viet Cong terror in Saigon. But still, America's commitment to South Vietnam remains firm. And United States troops in the embattled country are reinforced until in June 1965, more than 75,000 men are stationed there. Their sole purpose, says President Johnson, is to prove that force will meet force, that armed conquest is futile, and that aggression is not only wrong, but it just will not work. Even as the troops move up, the president reaffirms his offer for unconditional discussions on a peaceful settlement of the Vietnamese crisis. I will, Mr. Johnson says, talk to any government, anywhere, anytime, without any conditions. But until the aggression from the North ends, American troops remain alert and combat ready. Other nations also come to the aid of South Vietnam. The first of 15,000 troops from South Korea arrive and are welcomed in Saigon. 
Australia, old friend and World War II ally of the United States, supplies a detachment of volunteers. Six nations, in addition to America, send troops to South Vietnam. And still the reinforcements come as the communist challenge grows greater and the hour later. Another 50,000 U.S. combat troops are committed to the defense of freedom's outpost in Southeast Asia. It is a difficult, dangerous, demanding mission, but it is a mission that must be carried out. And so it is that today Americans fight and fall in South Vietnam. We did not choose to be the guardians at the gate, but there is no one else. We do not want an expanding struggle with consequences that no one can foresee, nor will we bluster or bully or flaunt our power. But we will not surrender, and we will not retreat. Strengthened by that promise, the people of South Vietnam have fought for many long years. Thousands of them have died. Thousands more have been crippled and scarred by war. And we just cannot now dishonor our word or abandon our commitment or leave those who believed us and who trusted us to the terror and repression and murder that would follow. This then, my fellow Americans, is why we're in Vietnam. This film has been presented by the Full Service Bank, Security National Bank at 7th and Minnesota, and Motor Bank, 7th and Ann. Free customer parking at both locations.